All right, everybody, welcome to the Gate Equity webinar series. Uh, I'm Kathy Anderson. Um, I'm a graduation equity program supervisor, and today we are talking about foundations of tribal sovereignty. This meeting is being recorded and is on YouTube live right now. Um, the PowerPoint is posted on OSPI on the Gate Equity webinar page, and we're going to add it to the chat. So if you want to follow along, uh, you can do that. November is National Native American Heritage Month, and we chose this topic because we want to honor our Native American students and families, and because we believe it's important to ground ourselves in the history of Native education to take steps towards educational justice. We recognize that educational policies have done a lot of harm, and if we intend to change, we have to acknowledge that devastating history and the resilience of tribal peoples and look for opportunities to dismantle and elevate to do better. We hope this webinar is an opportunity to introduce you to this topic, knowing there is a lot more to learn. Um, we do like to know who is in the audience. So if you can take a moment to introduce yourself to us, uh, you can rename um, by clicking on participants or just on your picture or and clicking more. And we'd love to know your first last name, your role in school or school district. And if you need help with this, Ronnie Larson is in the audience and she should be able to help you with the renaming. This webinar is brought to you through the Office of System and School Improvement in the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. At OSPI, we believe each student needs to be prepared for post-secondary pathways, careers, and civic engagement. We're driven to transform K-12 education to a system that's centered on closing opportunity gaps and is characterized by high expectations for all students and educators. We believe we'll achieve this by developing equity-based policies and supports that empower educators, families, and communities. And we aspire to have all of our work be driven by our values, ensuring equity, collaboration, and service, achieving excellence through continuous improvement, and focusing on the whole child. The Gate Equity webinar series was created with the purpose of highlighting practices that increase access to education and ultimately to graduation. Through our webinars, we're striving to go beyond equality, to think about the opportunities we have to examine and dismantle current policies and practices that result in disparate outcomes for our students with the ultimate goal of ensuring that each student has access to the instruction and support that will make them successful in school and in life. We want to acknowledge historical context and engage our students, families, and communities as partners in decision-making because they possess the strengths and cultural knowledge that will transform our schools. In this webinar, we seek to honor the people and lands native to America, and we also want to acknowledge the pain and trauma resulting from over 400 years of racism in the United States and against people of the African diaspora. We stand with our communities of color during these unprecedented times of civil unrest, especially those who identify as and or are categorized as Black and or African American. We'll continue to center our work in leading with racial equity. We wanna offer a moment of silence and afterward honor the space for people from communities of color to respond to this acknowledgement first. And then we invite allies and others to communicate their comments after. So um, we'll be using the chat box for that. We invite accountability and partnership today. We're gonna pause now to reflect. We're now gonna open the floor for our listeners from communities of color to respond to this acknowledgement first. If you'd like to speak, you may.
thank you all for participating. Um, for myself, I'd like to say every time I give this acknowledgement, I feel a little bit nervous, but I also think it's important to say out loud. So uh, thank you for your support and participation. Um, we'd love to see you all get clock hours for joining us today. So if you're planning to watch uh, the webinars, um, you can get an hour and a half credit or three hours credit um, for tuning in. Um, if you've registered with PD Enroller, all you have left to do is join for those two live we uh, webinars and do that PD Enroller evaluation. We do verify your attendance. Um, and so we should have a confirmation back to you by next week. If you have questions about this, you can talk to uh, Ronnie Larson. And um, shout out about YouTube. Um, in case you didn't know, we have an amazing YouTube channel. Uh, where we post all of our recordings. So if you can't make it or you want to share a recording with a friend, um, all you have to do is subscribe by clicking that little bell and you'll get alerts each time that we post a video. And that includes videos of Chris Reichdahl making announcements, all kinds of stuff. So um, it's a really useful um, subscription for YouTube. And we really encourage you to use that. Um, at 10,000 subscribers, we get free auto captioning, which is going to open up a lot of doors. Um, and make sure that we have captioning for all of our webinars. Um, today, we have several objectives we wanna cover. Um, we're gonna be looking at the historical grounding on policies that have impacted Native education. We'll be learning what it means for our American Indian and Alaskan Native students to be citizens of sovereign nations. And we'll learn about some of the issues with data collection and reporting for American Indian and Alaskan Native students. I have with me today, Director of Native Education at OSBI, John Claymore, and um, he's brought along with him also Laura Lynn, who is our Native Education Program Supervisor at OSBI. Um, we also have Joan Banker, who helps support their team for the Office of Native Education in the audience, and she's gonna be engaging with you as well. Um, we are so pleased to have you with us today. Um, I just, I can't even say, how cool it is to collaborate with the Office of Native Education on this work. Um, we do wanna know who's in our audience too. So to help introduce you to us, um, we are gonna have this poll here. Um, so let us know your role and what grade band do you work with and how familiar are you with our topic today? And while I do that, um, Laura Lynn is gonna share her screen but you should see the poll popping up on yours right now. And in that poll, uh, to, to end the, the poll for yourself, you have to answer all of the questions. So just make sure that you're um, getting all the way to the bottom. And if you're not seeing the poll pop-up window on your screen, it might be in your task bar at the bottom. Um, sometimes it, it comes up as a button for people. And Joan and Laura, your slides look great. They're up. And I'm gonna look at these. We have about 120 people who have voted. And I'm just gonna share these results back with you. Um, there's a lot of teachers in the audience. About 30% of our audience today is teachers. We've got a lot of ESD and district folks and counselors, as well as some administrators in there. Um, if you do fall in the other category, you can tell us about yourself in the chat. We're always interested in, in the various roles of people participating. There's a lot of secondary folks, and there's some who are both as well. And we have some people who are somewhat familiar with the topic. It looks like that's kind of the majority here, about 64%. So thank you for participating in the poll, everybody. Um, we are gonna go to Laura Lynn. And Laura Lynn, do you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself and um, we're going to start talking about this, Foundations of Tribal Sovereignty. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and uh, John, would you like to um, open our time together? Thank you. And John, you need to unmute your mic. Thanks. 
I apologize, folks. Um, the the on mute already hit, and we're only five minutes into this. So, um, but anyway, my name is John Claymore. I'm the director of Native Education for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. I have two folks with me from the office, um, both Laura Lynn, um, Dr. Laura Lynn, and um, Joan Banker. Um, if you guys could um, please um, start off with the, um, in a, introducing yourselves, and then I'll I'll follow up. Thank you. Thank you, John, um, and uh, good morning to uh, um, our family and our friends and colleagues um, who, who um, are here today. Um, and uh, we're really honored to be here and to be sharing our time together and to do this amazing learning together. Uh, my name is Dr. Laura Lynn. I'm the daughter of Grace Elizabeth Cusick and Kenneth Lee Rohr. Uh, my mother's mother was Doris Alva King. Um, and my grandmother's people are descendants of the Chickasaw people and also of European ancestry. Uh, my grandfather was Walter Raymond Cusick and uh, my grandfather's people um, are descendants of people of Eastern Europe. Uh, my father was Kenneth Lee Rohr and uh, my uh, father's mother was Laura Anna Mae Saida. That's who I'm named for. Um, my grandmother's mother, um, her people are of European ancestry, and my grandmother's father's people um, are peoples of uh, the Mideast of Syria. Uh, my grandfather was Emmett Aldoff Rohr, and both my, uh, grand, my, my grandfather's mother's and father's people um, are people of the Mideast of Syria. Um, I grew up Tacoma and Fox Island, um, and uh, I currently am, I am joining you um, from the beautiful ancestral lands of the Puyallup people. Um, I'm honored to be a member of the uh, Office of Native Education team and to, uh, to serve uh, with John, our director, and Joan Banker, who is our administrative program specialist, um, in order to meet the um, unique and um, uh, specific cultural needs of, of our over 61,000 American Indian Alaska Native learners who attend schools in our public schools, our seven tribal compact schools, and our, um, our, 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 um, our tribal school, uh, Pascal Sherman. Um, it's really great to see that you're joining us from um, many places across the state and appreciate um, your, your leadership and, and the work that you do with all of our students each and every day. Thank you. Thank you, Laura Lynn. Joan, um, with, if you would introduce yourself, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joan Banker, and I get to work with Laura Lynn and John Claymore in the Office of Native Education, and I'm so happy that all of you are joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Laura. Uh, my name is John Claymore. I'm the Director of Native Education for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. With, with the, and the Office of Native Education. I come to you today from the traditional lands of the Suquamish people. I live out here in Paulsville, Washington. I was born in Crow Agency, Montana. I grew up in Fort Yates, North Dakota on a Standing Rock Reservation and enrolled, down in, and enrolled on my father's side in Eagle Butte, South Dakota on a Cheyenne River Reservation. There's seven different bands of the Lakota Sioux. I belong to what's called the Hunk Papa Sioux. On my mother's side, she's enrolled Chippewa from the White Earth Reservation out in White Earth, Minnesota. I come to you today with an open heart and an open mind as a continual learner. As we, as we recognize and, and learn more, take a deeper dive into learning more about what's some taking place past our, with, with um, Native education, past, present, and future. Um, with this said, the land acknowledgements that you just heard, I want to make sure that it's clear that there's a lot of momentum right now, both from Native and non-Native folks um, giving land acknowledgements. There's a lot of work in progress right now with that taking place. The first thing that needs to happen is, is um, through consultation. And um, I always say there's no right or wrong way to give a land, land acknowledgement as long as we're recognizing the right lands. And um, in today's slide deck, you'll, we'll um, touch base on that briefly, uh, at, but knowing that there's um, more work in place that's taking place right now, um, both internally and externally in regards to land acknowledgements. So with that said, um, Basically, what you heard there was a uh, land acknowledgement is, is giving respect to the, the first stewards of the land. And also, it gives us the opportunity to tell our story in a, in a real um, brief way. 
So the land acknowledgement piece, again, uh, more work um, in place are in progress as we speak and looking forward to um, touching base with each and every one of you, both internally and externally. So um, with that, next slide, please. So we want to acknowledge that um, the, the work that we're doing collectively together um, is work around um, uh, creating um, inclusive, of spaces within our education system. And to do that, it requires that we um, lead um, as anti-racist um, educators. Um, and as we're becoming um, anti-racist educators, uh, transforming and working with in uh, anti-racist anti educational uh, places and spaces, um, we, it's important that we have opportunity um, to be able to uh, show up and be present in a good way with each other. Um, and to do that, uh, there, there are um, protocols around courageous conversation agreements. We just wanted to uh, share some agreements um, and ask also that uh, if you have additional agreements that you have found that allow you to be fully present within these kinds of, of um, spaces and, the, and to attend to your learning and the learning of others, um, please add those into the, into our, into the chat as well. We ask that you stay uh, that we stay engaged with each other. Um, uh, we know within within uh, the remote environment, it's easy for us to be distracted with um, other things that call to call to our attention. Um, that uh, we know that um, when we're sharing um, sharing our, our truths um, and and speaking our stories, um, that that we might be experiencing discomfort within this space. Um, and ask that you continue to lean in, to uh, just check in in terms of what it is that you're feeling, but again, continue to stay engaged. Um, again, uh, please uh, share, uh, share your truths, share your stories. It's important that we have opportunity and space to do that. And again, we, we're really honored that you're here today for, for us to share um, some, of, some of these truths today. Um, we know that the work of, of um, developing um, anti-racist leadership and also um, uh, uh, anti-racist uh, schools and school structures and um, learning opportunities for all of our students. We're not gonna get this done in one webinar. We're not gonna get this done even in, in, in one day. Um, each day and each moment is important, but we, we want to expect and accept that, that we will have um, non-closure. Um, also, we invite that um, we, we enter the space uh, with the places of um, positive intent and that we bestow that upon each other, but also recognize that um, how things might land um, will have impact and that we, we want to encourage and foster opportunity um, to speak to under have deeper understanding with each other. And, and so it's important that we understand and be able to articulate the impacts um, that each of us individually may be experiencing as well. Um, and finally, that um, these conversations um, are about disrupting um, uh, 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 racist practices um, and that we want to continue to um, elevate um, uh, um, inclusive and responsive practices as, as part of our, our way of being. Um, and again, thank you for adding um, additional, um, additional agreements that help you to stay present within these conversations. Laura Lynn, thank you so much for that. I just want to add on, um, folks, as we go through our slide deck today, Laura Lynn and myself will be taking turns on presenting on and adding in and so forth. Um, we'll have three different um, um, times that we'll pause the, the presentation for question and answers and so forth as we um, move through the deck itself. Um, but I wanted to add on to this prior to moving forward. The, you know, staying engaged, experience discomfort, speak your truth and accept and, and accept non-closure. Um, and then we talked about impact and disrupt and, and elevate. I want to talk just briefly about that, um, the discomfort piece there. Um, the information that you're going to see today is, um, is being provided with the intent of um, providing support and a better understanding of what's taking place, knowing that some of the information that will be shared will create different um, levels of discomfort. 
And we totally understand that. And it's not our intent to push people in the corners and this and that and whatever else. It's not our intent to point fingers because I was always told by my father growing up who was an educator of 32 years that when you start pointing fingers, there's three always coming back at you. So make sure that our house is clean and so forth. And, and, and the, 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 the discomfort that we're, we'll be sharing is um, dealing with some of the data that will be shared here in our deck. And it's that same discomfort um, that you might experience is what I experience every time I take a look at this data. Um, there is all kinds of work ahead of us um, as, we, as we get through this and so forth. And I'm calling on all hands, all hands on deck to take a, a real close look a focus and, a, and come up and start taking a look at a focused attempt at uh, making sure that we're making a difference in the native youth of today and the leaders of tomorrow. Um, it's very important um, with this information as sovereign students and as sovereign nations. And again, the last thing I'll say on this slide is expect and accept non-closure folks. Um, this did not take place overnight. And when we untangle um, this process and, and, and reweave our braid, um, then things will start happening. Appreciate it. Next slide, please. Okay, first thing that we're going to talk about is we're, we got a couple maps here that we want to show you and or share with you and so forth. And again, a disclosure um, within native country. Um, I haven't found a map yet that um, that we can all agree upon. So with that said, the first of you know, one of those norms, um, expect non-closure um, and that type of thing. But let's talk about these seeded and unseeded lands. Um, with that, what you see in front of you is the state of Washington. These were um, lands um, that were occupied by the different 29 federally recognized tribes and, and others as well um, prior to the, the signing of the treaties. If you take a look at the middle portion there, the peach area there, and I'll just kind of, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about two areas in specific. Well, actually three. If you take a look at that peach area there, that's covering two thirds of the state of Washington. Those lands were occupied by the Yakima Nation um, tribal folks um, prior to the, the signing of the treaties and so forth. If you take a look at the two areas down in the left side are um, the, the southwest and you take a look over in the Spokane area there, those are um, unshaded areas. And if you take a look at the scale on the map, it says unoccupied territories. We know better than that. And Bernie Tom, Superintendent Bernie Thomas from Lummi Indian Nation School will, will um, speak quite eloquently on this. Um, these lines um, were established by somebody else. Um, knowing that our, our tribal folks um, occupied these lands and beyond. And when we talk about unoccupied lands, um, this will come up later in the presentation as well uh, when we start um, talking about federally and, and um, non-federally recognized tribes. But um, as Bernie Thomas, again, superintendent at Lummi Indian Nation School, will talk, we were all over for different reasons. If it was um, getting into the, the rivers and the streams and, and whatever else to um, fish and do whatever we need to do, or if it's getting up into the mountains to, to hunt and gather, or if it was um, getting into the other tribes for um, um, taking a look, or finding a bride type of thing. So the intermarriages within the different tribes, but um, these lands were occupied by all natives um, since time immemorial. And, um, and, the, the, the next area that I'd like to talk to you about is that little green shaded area in the middle there that um, takes place all the way from Tacoma all the way up into um, Canada. Um, these are the lands that um, the Muckleshoot um, tribal folks occupied, along with others um, that both federally and non-federally recognized tribes um, within this gray shaded, shaded area. But you can see some of the, the um, potential discrepancies and um, issues that we have when we start talking about land acknowledgements and making sure that we're acknowledging the right lands. Um, and, and again, those that did not, that were not awarded lands, um, our reservation lands were those that did not sign treaties. Does that make them non-native? Absolutely not. So this is a real touchy subject um, that we're dealing with on a daily basis, and we're figuring, figuring it out as we go along. Mm -hmm. 
And what you see here on this next uh, on this next uh, map here is what it is what it is today, what it looks like today, as the lands were diminished into um, set boundary lines as far as reservations. And again, if you take a look at um, where Yakima is down in the south south central part of the state, um, you kind of see where they're what what the reservation lo lands look like today. And again, the the red pins are the 29 different um, federally recognized tribes. And the only thing I would add is that um, notice too that um, we're also acknowledging the lands of, um, of, of peoples to the north and to the east um, and, and to the south that um, uh, again, these are political boundaries, but in terms of our, re our relations and our relatives that we have, we have uh, relatives um, um, uh, you know, across these political boundaries, um, including across our, our uh, reservation boundaries as well. Um, so I just would add that. Thank you, Laura Lynn. And absolutely. Um, and as you'll see in slide in the slides that will come up, you'll see um, three different um, tribes recognized as signatories to the court as well. So those are our neighbors that we're talking about. So as you consider um, the, the, the maps and uh, some, just some of the very brief history that John um, has shared in terms of, of uh, tribal peoples um, and our relationships with our lands and waters, um, and recognizing that um, we are still here today. Um, if you could just briefly add into the chat, um, what story do you feel um, is coming to you in terms of the story that these maps are telling? Both the the first the first map of the ceded and unceded lands, as well as um, uh, the reservation, um, because we know that um, uh, that that really the the maps um, are a way of representing um, and sharing uh, sharing story that way. Um, and uh, we just wanted to hear from you in terms of what what you see the story being, um, what 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 strikes what strikes you about about those maps. And Joan, I, um, I believe you're helping to kind of monitor um, and if there's a, anything coming forward, if you could share that, that would be great. Um, I have one, the maps tell the story that the people were banished to small territory that are restrictive and limiting. Um, the loss of land for native peoples. Um, a lot of people are recognizing the loss of land and the big impact to native people. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Joan. Um, and, and even with that, um, as we know, within our treaties, um, the, the uh, tribes also uh, retained rights. Um, and one of the rights that's been retained through, through uh, the treaties um, is the right to um, hunt fish and gather in usual and accustomed places. Um, and, and that's that, the recognition of our, of our traditional life ways that exceed beyond uh, the uh, reservation boundaries, um, and uh, and so again, that even as tribe as tribal nations were um, uh, 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 granting land to the U.S. government for settlement, uh, the tribe tribes our our ancestors um, uh, continue to retain rights uh, for for those of us who are here today. And a lot of the work that we're engaged in, um, it's about uh, what we're doing today to ensure the well-being of those who are here today and those who are yet to come. So thank you again for um, sharing your, your insights about that. I'll tell you just what's hitting on that chat line, folks. Uh, it's giving me goosebumps. I get really excited when goosebumps pop out. So um, thank you for sharing um, that information. Let's talk about these federally recognized tribes. Um, I believe these are all hyperlinks. Um, if you click on them and that type of thing that they'll pop up and they'll show you um, different um, uh, just snapshots of what's taking place within the tribes and all kinds of really cool information. The one that I really um, enjoyed um, taking a look at is, where's that one at? Um, um, Kalispell. 
Yeah, Kalispell. I'll tell you, talk about 20 seconds of power in pictures and music. Um, if you get an opportunity to take a look at that, and it really tells a story about past, present, and future and where they're going. But here, um, folks, what you have on here is you have the 29 different um, federally recognized tribes. Um, also, what we mentioned just prior to was the signatories out of, of out of the state accord, Nez Perce, Umatilla, and Warm Springs as well. Um, as sovereign nations, folks, um, this is this is critical um, on what we're going to be talking about here shortly with um, um, some of the data and so forth and what that could look like as a sovereign nation and also as sovereign students. Um, the non-federally recognized tribes, um, there we got uh, seven of them listed here. If you take a look at the two, the two on the top, Chinook and Duwamish, um, those two tribes are in pending status and what that means could um, is that they're, they're at the table. They've been in pending status for some time now, folks. It's not something that's um, new or anything like that. The others, the other um, five um, tribes that are are at the at the table are are, are actually not at the table. They're listed, but um, nothing as far as pending status or anything like that. So when we take a look at that, um, the the both the federally and non federally recognized tribes. We really got to kind of do a little dance, dancing around this, or not around it, but um, making sure that both federally recognized and non federally recognized tribes are a part of our land acknowledgements and, and our work ahead. So, um, and as we um, move forward, we wanted to offer um, some key vocabulary that you'll, um, you'll hear us um, discussing today. Um, and that we just want to call to your um, attention uh, as you know, foundational um, vocabulary as you um, both are serving American Indian Alaska Native um, uh, students and their families. Um, also, if you have responsibilities um, in terms of um, the relationship building in, in the government to government spaces, because that's the relationship um, between uh, the tribal nations and um, and our and our school districts and other um, entities, um, the relationship is uh, is government to government. Um, um, so I won't read all of the words, um, but just want you to, that just so that you know that we're going to be um, sharing these words. And you've already shared several, but there are more to come. So, for example, this word here, regalia. Um, that re that refers to um, um, our our tra traditional and um, an ancestral um, uh, clothing and attire um, that is part of how uh, um, a part of, of how we share who we are within our um, our, tra our traditional ceremonies, but also within uh, gatherings of important events. Um, and, and sometimes there's a, um, a misuse of the word costume. That's not appropriate. Um, this, is, this is, again, can, our regalia is related to um, who we are. It connects us to our ancestors and, um, and our identities. Um, and again, it also has um, an importance in terms of the work that we do and how we, how we are present within that work. Um, and there was legislation that was recently passed um, that is now part of state law. Um, it, it is the Right to uh, Tribal Regalia Act um, that now requires that um, districts um, honor when our students are wearing regalia for graduation of purposes um, that, 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 we, that we attend to that work in a good way. Um, so there are other, um, there's other vocabulary. Um, and again, there's stories um, and more work to be done and understanding to do with each of these words. And these aren't the only words, but it's just a good starting place for us. So thank you. Thank you, Laura Lynn. If you can just back up just a second, Laura, I just want to add on to that as well. You know, with what Laura said on the House Bill 2551, the right to wear um, regalia. It took a law. It took law to make sure that that took place, and that that that's what blows my mind away. Um, and again, it's not just for graduation ceremonies; it's for any type of ceremony that um, we're we're talking about academic achievement or, or recognizing that um, recognizing our, our our kids. So, thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. So we're getting ready to kind of open up the space in terms of deepening our understanding of tribal sovereignty together. And, and if you could just take a moment, please, to post into the chat, um, um, why do you have, a, why you have an interest in learning more about tribal sovereignty? So we can begin to kind of create a foundation with each other 
um, if you could just take a moment, uh, a word, a phrase that comes to mind in terms of, of why this is important to you. Um, and then uh, we're gonna, um, Joan's going to read a few of your comments. Um, it, it won't be all, but we, we want to give space for everyone to have a chance to, to share that in. Why is this important to you and to your practice? And Joan, could you share in a couple of the uh, comments that are coming forward? Um, one of them is um, like government to government consultation between districts and tribes and uh, respect and honoring tribal nations and kind of understanding um, the puzzle of tribal sovereignty and tribal relations and how it relates to today's um, tribes and culture. Um, tribes exist today and sovereignty is alive and well in Indian country. So thank you and please continue to, to um, share, share into, into the chat um, it, it, and lift your voice up. This is an opportunity um, please for you to voice in and for us to learn together. And I appreciate too um, that you continue to attend uh, to reading the chat and the comments that are being offered by um, your colleagues uh, today too. That That's a, a way for us to continue to strengthen our work together. So um, thank you, Joan, thank you also. And folks, thank you so much. You know, um, I just wanna add in as well, um, in our in our language, in, in my language, the Lakota language, we, we re refer to this as our, we commonly say, aho, thank you. Thank you for those comments and what's coming at and what's hitting that chat box. Um, you know, that government to government relationship um, or government to government, government to government training that Joan mentioned that came through the chat. Um, the Office of Native Education is taking a look at that um, to, and working with um, Craig Bill on, on, um, on, on what that government to government training looks like. What we want to add in the add into that training to enhance and complement the training in place is to um, focus on the education piece. What does that look like? So we're really excited about that. And the, the just uh, uh, general from the chat line and what's coming about, it's all about that relationship, folks. It's all about that relationship and that relational trust. So thank you for that. Laura Lynn, start us yeah. off on data, please. So we're going to turn our attention to um, um, one of the um, issues that we face, uh, and I say we because this is a, this is an issue for all of us, um, uh, as it relates to both the identification um, and then the data uh, collection and reporting uh, processes um, around uh, uh, the experiences of American Indian Alaska Native um, learners within our schools. Um, and we wanted to just to share um, some information about, um, uh, first of all, about the identification. And I wanna uh, just say thank you. Uh, Ronnie's gonna be posting um, a link into the chat um, where you can uh, find out more about, uh, this, uh, uh, about this issue and some of the considerations. Um, there's a, a, a space called Obscured Identities from um, Ed Northwest that she's sharing in. Um, and the report, uh, you can find the Obscured Identities report right at the bottom of that page when you, when you click into that. Um, so here in Washington State, um, when our students enroll in our schools, um, uh, their families are asked um, uh, to, uh, to identify um, uh, by uh, racial, uh, either by race and or by um, ethnicity. Um, and, and, and again, um, our identity is not by race or ethnicity. Our identity um, has to do with our um, affiliation with our, with our um, nations. Um, and our students are actually citizens of sovereign nations and descendants of sovereign nations. So there's, there's some conflict um, in this process alone um, as, a, as it uh, relates to who we are and, and us really being able to uh, fully, uh, uh, fully serve American Indian Alaska Native learners. But as, as part of our current enrollment processes, um, students and their families are identifying in one of these three uh, 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 categories, American Indian Alaska non-Hispanic, 
American Indian, Alaska Native, Hispanic, American Indian, Alaska Native, two or more races. Now, as you can see in this first category, um, uh, this is the data reporting for 2018-19 um, that we have uh, just over 15,000 um, American Indian Alaska Native uh, students uh, who, who have been identified uh, through, through this category. Um, this is the category that is also reported from the state um, to the federal government for purposes not only of reporting but also um, in terms of uh, funding. Um, this has implications in terms of um, other uh, education opportunities as well. But we have two other categories that our students identify through. The American Indian Alaska Native Hispanic, where we have over 27,000 students um, who identify, and American Indian Alaska Native two or more races, and we have almost 19,000 students within this category. Um, and when we consider all three of these categories, um, we have over 61,000 American Indian Alaska Native learners um, that we, ha we have responsibility um, to be serving and to do that in a way that we are honoring and recognizing uh, the, the, uh, that, that each of our students is a citizen and or descendant of, 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 of citizen of, of sovereign tribal nations. Now you can see that um, there's a huge discrepancy between 61,000 and the 15,000 that's reported from, from the state. Um, and so again, um, when, we, when we think about um, issues around uh, data, um, it begins right at the point of enrollment. Um, and, then there are, then, and then there are further um, complexities and frankly, it's uh, uh, misrepresentations within our data systems um, that, that continue to grow from there. Uh, John, did you wanna to continue to respond to, the, to this slide? Thank you, Laura Lynn. And you know, like we mentioned before, a lot of um, what we're covering today is, is through stories. I wanna share a story with you, but I wanna take a, a pause here because this is where some of this discomfort could come into play and so forth. Um, as, as, as I tell the story on, on how I first learned about this and so forth. Um, my first day at office was on February 10th. And um, 30 days later, they told me go home, work remotely, and this and that. So I didn't get to network with uh, the folks that I'd like to, and, and this and that, and so forth. Um, but as I was getting ready to um, um, put my name in the hat for this position, I said, I got one shot at this. I'm going to put my best foot forward, not sometimes, all the time. Um, this is where the change is going to take place. And just really excited about that opportunity to um, apply for the Director of Native Education for the Office of uh, Superintendent of Public Instruction. So when I was doing my research and taking a look at the OSPI annual report card, um, the 2018-19, that's and what Laura mentioned, that's this data here that you're looking at. It was, um, it, it really um, uh, raised some red flags really concerned because with 32 years of, of experience in Native, um, Native American education, I knew that these numbers weren't right, what I was seeing. But I, I intentionally used those numbers as I, as I went into my interview to um, get a better, you know, to start, um, start the process and uh, take a deeper dive into what this could look like. Um, so when I shared this information um, during my interview, they said, no, that, that we got more kids than that. And I said, absolutely, I know we do. I can count these number of kids on, on a number of different schools. And so with that said, when I, when I took the position, um, that was one of my first um, charges. I wanna find out more about this data and why it's looking like this and, and get a better understanding of, of what this looks like. And like what, um, what um, Dr. Laura Lynn mentioned, there's a 46,000 or 45 to 46,000 um, difference in the data that's being collected. I know we have more than 61,000 kids, native kids in the state of Washington, if the data was being correct, uh, collected the way it needs to be. But when I see a difference between 45,000 kids, I, the first thing that pops into my head as a, as a, as a former teacher and administrator, I'm thinking um, funding and services, funding and services, and, and what could that look like? So with that said, there's a lot of work right now that's taking place with um, data collection and, and what that could look like and so forth, not only at the state level, but at the national level. 
So um, more work ahead on this as well in, in properly identifying our students to make sure that one, they're at the table, two, they're getting the services um, um, as needed. So this is what I'm talking about as far as some of this discomfort. It, it, it makes me, I, I really have a hard time even looking at it, folks. I'll just say it, just, just put it out there. Um, those, of, those of you that know me, um, straightforward. Culture, candor, transparency, let's get it out, let's deal with it, let's work on it, and so forth. I want to make sure, again, that what comes out of my mouth is not um, to blame. Um, it, it's, all, it's all good. This is an all-hands-on approach that we need to take a look at because this is disturbing. And, and again, I want to thank um, my brothers and sisters out there in Native education that are taking part in doing this work. I also want to thank my, my colleagues within OSPI for coming today to joining today, taking a look at what, what this is and what we can do differently. But I also want to thank Superintendent Reichdahl for his support. Folks, I know it, it, it's taken some time to get us to this point, and it's going to take time to get us out of this. But with Superintendent Reichdahl's um, um, focused intent and the supports that he's providing is um, very appreciative. <laughs> All the way from um, um, providing supports to the R16 Comprehensive Center that, that, that um, provides focus um, directly to Native learners. Um, all the way to uh, our native language grants with Patty Finnegan. We, we dispersed close to $480,000 this year for native language grants. We were awarded a new position within the Office of Native Education, a CTE position, and I hope she, and that she might be on here today. I'm not quite sure, but Miss um, Shandy Abraham, Abrahamson will be our new CTE position really excited and I always tell people if I could do a cartwheel I would right now folks because this is the right work this is what's going to en help engage our kids into this um the learning process I call them passions of program and there's also another position that we're looking at adding on as well so stay tuned there and and we we totally understand that um sometimes um we work in our silos and we got to break down those silos because what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the full picture. I'm looking at early childhood, um, the, the, the K-12 system and post-secondary as well, and how we can weave these together to make sense. So with this here, I wanna go through this, this data. Again, this is off the 2018-19 um, report card, annual report card. And I'm a very competitive person, um, both in my work and outside of life as well. And um, always shooting for number one, whatever that might be or could look like. But um, with this information that we have here, the dropout rate, or, or as I commonly refer to it as the push out. And, and the reason why I say that is because um, this, the, the information, the data that you're seeing today is a, a direct indicator that um, our system is not aligned to our native learners. So dropout rate out of the six ethnicities identified, we come in um, number one. And this is what's heart, heartbreaking is 24%. Um, 24% <laughs> of our native um, learners are dropping out on an annual basis. What that's equivalent to is a little over 15,000 kids. What that's equivalent to is one in four. What's that, what that's an equi equivalent to is, uh, is um, 25 out of 100. You know, um, 2,500 out of 10,000. Getting out to 15,000, it is that it's, it's, um, uh, definitely a red flag. The next closest ethnicity identified is at 11.2%. So there's a huge gap there. And what that's telling me is our kids are not engaged. They're not buying into the system that's being provided. And what can we do differently to make sure that um, our kids are getting to that the graduation stage? And one of my um, common sayings, it, sayings is going the distance and making a difference in the native youth of today and the leaders of tomorrow. What's that look like? What's that look like for these kids? Statewide, when you talk about, you know, we, we, um, Native American learners, 24%, average statewide, 9%. Huge, huge gap that we need to fill. Focused attention. When we start taking a look at the assessment areas um, um, within the, the report card, English language arts, we're sixth place. We're at 31% proficient. We're in statewide, we're at 60, huge gap. Mathematics, sixth place, 22% proficient. Statewide, 
Ah. Science, we bumped up a spot to fifth. 24% proficient, 47% statewide. What this data, again, what this data is telling me, it's not, we're not aligned. And what can we do to make sure that that's taking place? When you talk about that dropout pushout rate um, at that 24%, but we also have the, the, the highest population, the, the highest percentage of, of native learners that, were, that are considered continuing learners beyond that fourth year. They're hanging in there. They're trying to get there. So fifth, sixth, seventh year seniors, they're trying to get there for a brighter future. <clears throat> the one thing I always, this, this is my all time favorite quote. As you heard of my land acknowledgement, that's where I grew up was in Fort Yates, North Dakota on the Standing Rock Reservation. <clears throat> and this is kind of difficult. And this is about the connection to the land. Chief Sitting Bull, um, grave sites there right in Fort Yates walked by it every day on my way to school. It had all kinds of meaning. There'd be times where my dad would, ha ha would come and find me sitting on top of that rock, reading, writing, doing whatever, connecting. <clears throat> but what he says, let, let us put our minds together to see what life we will make for our children. This is an all hands on deck approach. And I apologize for my passion, it comes out. But the data we're looking at today, we, we, need, to, we need to unweave this. We need to figure this out. We need to figure out how we can um, connect our kids. Because again, there's 25% of them that are not making it to that stage. And those 25, I'll tell you what, um, it's gonna be a long, hard road. Next slide, please. Man, I love this slide. It resonates in the back of my head. Every time I see this, think about this, it brings so much meaning. I don't like reading to people because I know we're all readers, but I, I wanna read this. And where this comes from is where the sun rises. Back in 2008, we were talking about this way back in 1928 these same things. But what I really like about this vision, it's strength-based, it's asset-based. And this is, um, I'll read it. Indian education dates back to a time when all children were identified as gifted and talented. Each child had a skill and ability that would contribute to the health and vitality of the community. Everyone in the community helped to identify and cultivate these skills and abilities. My all-time favorite sense right here, folks, the elders were entrusted to oversee the sacred act of knowledge being shared. That is still our vision for Indian country today. There's no such thing as a throwaway kid. Yet we're doing that in, in a roundabout way. So again, all hands on deck approach. What can we do? And I keep saying it's about that relational trust. It's, it's figuring out who we are. It's about taking those conversations to talk to those kids that, that are in your schools, not only the kids, the families, the tribal members, getting a better idea of what this is about and what this is called is tribal consultation. Through legislation, we try to put some teeth to it to have an end date to make sure that all schools were, were taking part in this consultation. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, but it's the right thing to do. If we're truly concerned about our, our native learners, it's we need to reach out with long arms. We need to provide wraparound services for these kids. They're most deserving. With my 32 years as involved in, in Native education, I'll tell you what, when that relationship is established, when that trust is there, these kids will do wonderful things for you. Laura Lynn. So we want to take a moment um, to, um, to um, hear your feedback um, around a couple of questions. Um, if you could share with us again in the chat, um, something that you found surprising um, about the data and, uh, of um, American Indian Alaska Native students. Um, 
and also begin to uh, continue to weave this directly into your work in terms of um, how does this connect with your work um, and with, with students, families, and colleagues that you are serving. So both, uh, you know, something that stood out for you um, around the, the data part of our presentation, and then uh, uh, how does this connect with, with your work? If you could just take a moment to share into the chat, and then uh, again, uh, Joan will graciously read, you know, bring forward some of the responses that you're sharing with us. Joan, are there some responses that you could share in? A lot of people are, are really surprised about the number of Native um, American Indian, Native Alaska Native students there are, and, um, and at the stats of their graduation and uh, academic achievement, and the discrepancies in the performance between our students and non-Native students. Um, it's a real eye opener for a lot of people how our kids are doing and passionately thinking about how to make changes in the, that data. Thank you. Yes, and I think again, it, 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 it's you know, starting at the time of enrollment, you know, asking ourselves, um, what, are the, what are the enrollment practices in terms of the identification of our students? Um, all the way in terms of just as, as we're um, uh, making or, or bringing forward our data that we continue to ask the question that at the local level um, that, we, that we do the analysis of our data, including um, all three categories of, of learners as well. Um, and, and then as John um, has indicated that um, through consultation processes, um, that's where our opportunity then comes to um, design uh, programs and uh, opportunities that will make the shift to turn, uh, you know, to, to, to really turn um, what, what is currently going on within our, our education systems to ensure um, that each and every uh, um, American Indian and Alaska Native learner has full opportunity and benefit um, to, uh, uh, to education. Um, and again, recognizing that um, that is a, it is a it, it's a it's a legal responsibility as well as a moral responsibility um, that, uh, that that we have to do that work. Um, so, uh, thank you again for sharing and continue to please continue to share in too because um, we're going to continue to read along with each other and continue to learn alongside with each other as well. Um, and uh, so we wanted to uh, begin to turn our attention now to. Um, continuing to um, unpack a little bit about the um, how did we get to the place because the data that that uh, John shared um, in terms of the of the uh, some of the, the uh, performance indicators um, it, it, which is again uh, we know that there is a lot more that goes into that in terms of the experiences that our students and families are having within our schools um, that didn't just happen um, overnight um, that there is some history here, and it's important for us to understand uh, and have some foundation um, in, in, in this history um, in order um, to really make uh, the disruptions and to do the shifts that we're going to and transformations that we're going to need to do within within our um, our systems. Um, so wanted to begin by uh, sharing just a little bit of, of information around uh, around uh, uh, tribal tribal history. Um, and you've heard us uh, use this term uh, since time immemorial or time immemorial. Um, and that's an important uh, term within, within uh, tribal communities. And that, 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 that refers to a time um, of, of our ancestors. And for tribal people, um, this is representing thousands and thousands of, 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 of years of known and lived experience. Um, this timeline was uh, developed and shared by uh, um, Toby Jarman, who, who works in the Seattle Public Schools, and she shared it as part of our Teacher to Teacher uh, uh, Since Time Memorial webinar series. 
And this is how she teaches her students about timelines. And I just, it's so beautiful. So this part right here represents the time uh, since what we would call the, the uh, colonization period. And when we use the term since time immemorial, it's talking about all of this other time. And then it's because it's important for each of us and our students to be able to position ourselves within, within history. Um, and so that just gives you kind of a sense of, of um, when we're talking about since time immemorial, uh, what it is that we're talking about, right? Um, and then this, uh, um, uh, this graphic is actually, it's a, it's a um, timeline of, a tri of a tribal, tribal history. And I'm gonna uh, pull up in an, another, uh, this might make it a little bit easier for you to uh, see this. Um, and I believe Ronnie is gonna be posting uh, this into the chat. Um, so that you have that as well. Um, so this timeline begins um, here with uh, since time immemorial. And again, if you think about it, if this were a true representation, this would really take up most of the circle. Um, and, uh, and we want to, um, again, uh, honor and recognize that these teachings are still here with us um, um, and they've been shared. Uh, from generation to, uh, to generation through, um, through our stories, uh, through the teachings, through our life ways, how we live, how we are with each other, through our languages. Um, and, uh, and so even though uh, th this is not just um, only a long time ago, um, this is also within our time today as well. Um, the second part of this timeline um, is referencing um, some, uh, some of the early contact or pre-contact work um, that was going on in Europe that, um, that led to some foundational principles that continue to be expressed and certainly are part of that. When John was sharing that push out rate of 24%, um, we have to acknowledge that some of these practices um, in terms of the papal bulls and the doctrine of discovery um, continue to be manifest um, in our experiences in schools today. Um, and then uh, we went into, um, you know, further work um, um, in terms of the establishment of the, of the, uh, of the U.S. Um, and then uh, um, upon the founding, uh, founding of the United States, um, uh, uh, this is again, this is the time um, after the, after um, contact, um, after uh, the, uh, uh, um, the, the treaty times um, and the removals that were part of the treaty times as well. Um, now we're going into specific policies that were in play uh, with the uh, United States government. Um, and uh, so, and these again are specific uh, forms of legislation that were uh, brought forward. Um, and if we know our history, we know that even prior to the treaty times uh, through, this, through the intentional spread of, of um, disease, that up to 90% of tribal peoples actually were, were, were killed through the spreading of disease. And then we had um, the work that went on uh, with the treaties. And what you're gonna read here, these, these are policies that are uh, genocidal policies um, and they are continued uh, policies around uh, 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 forced assimilation. Um, and, and, um, and again, uh, please continue to lean in because this is, these, this is not, uh, again, easy histories uh, for, for us to reconcile. Um, and yet uh, it's not, we're not sharing it from a place of blame and shame. It's really come from a place of let's, we need to acknowledge the, the, the truth of these histories in order to, to, to uh, make the changes that we, that we um, must make in our time today. Um, in this section right here is part of the assimilation um, and the, 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 the intent of the legislation was um, kill, uh, kill the Indian, save the man, um, uh, was, was the mission schools and the boarding schools. Um, and again, this is where uh, uh, native children were forcibly removed uh, from, uh, from their families um, and taken to uh, uh, schools that were far away from their people um, and they were um, um, denied um, and actually punished for um, exercising their their uh, languages. Uh, they were they they were forced to dress in Western like clothing. Um, their whole appearance, their hair was cut, um, and there it was a time of of um, ext extreme um, abuse and trauma. 
Um, and that time is remembered today. When you look at this time, this is 1934, you know, our elders um, have memories of these times today. Um, and so um, it's not like this is some long time ago, um, but we wanted to, again, uh, just continue. We, know, we need to know our own history because um, th this is part of, of US history and it's part of Washington state history. And it's important for us to, to, have, these, to have these understandings. Um, Laura Lynn, this, yes. Laura Lynn, I apologize. I, I just got to interrupt just for a second. Um, your screen looks differently and some people are saying they can't see it right now. we got the tiles off to the side. Can you go full screen to see if that makes a difference? Sure. Is that helping at all? I'm seeing the same, same thing. Oh, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, we, that's why we wanted to include, uh, include the poster um, in that. Um, I apologize for the, the, the difficulty and John, thank you for sharing that. Um, if I could just, and I know I'm gonna come back to the, uh, to the slideshow and use the graphic within the slideshow because we know that that one can be seen by everyone. Um, so what I was sharing was, this is the Since Time Memorial. This time is continuing in our time today. Um, these are the practices um, of, uh, you know, of both uh, pre-contact and also contact, um, and then the founding of U.S. That those experiences continue in our time today. Um, the policies of the U.S. of, of U.S. government policy, um, and also these are expressions that also were practiced within uh, uh, once Washington State was founded. Washington State history as well that continue into our time today. Um, and again, these are about policies of, of um, assimilation and um, also experiences of genocide. Um, and then this, this, uh, this part of the, of the uh, circle is sharing about the time that we're in now, which is uh, um, the, uh, again, continued assertion of tribal sovereignty um, and self uh, nation building and, and self-determination. Um, and these are several Washington state, um, US and also international uh, uh, um, laws and initiatives that are going on to, to continue to strengthen our work in, to, in today. Um, this outside ring, um, these are a series of reports that have been shared in, uh, of, of the documentation of the miseducation of native peoples. And as John said in his comments, um, that, uh, that first report was shared to Congress in uh, 1928, the Miriam Report. And what you'll see is the, that data that John shared um, continues to be manifest um, in the data that John shared and then this most recent national report as well. Um, and so again, um, we, there, we must rec both reconcile um, um, our, our history um, and continue to strengthen our relationships and our opportunities to do consultation with each other. Um, so with that as kind of as a, a, a backdrop, um, when you hear the term tribal sovereignty, because we've used that, what comes to mind for you? I mean, what does that mean to you when we use that term tribal sovereignty? If you could enter in your, your considerations into the chat, and while you're doing that, I'm going to share screen one more time, and let's see if we can get this going in a good way. And, it, um, and as you're sharing, Joan's going to, if you could read in, um, uh, what, what's coming to mind for people when we share, what, 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 what is tribal sovereignty? What does that mean to us? Joan, what's coming forward? I see their um, right, right of a tribe to make choices um, of, about their communities and the lands that they govern, um, right to govern themselves, right to choose their citizens. A lot is self-government, self-governing, um, nations within nations, independent nations, uh, legal and cultural freedom, Um, but mostly it's the right of tribes to govern themselves and their people. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. 
And um, we wanted to share just a, this is about three minute video that's been shared by some of, uh, um, some of our uh, tribal leaders um, sharing about uh, what, what, um, what it means, what tribal sovereignty means to uh, tribal peoples. So um, give me a chance here, sorry. Let's set this up. Laura, we can't see your video. David Bean, Steve Scott. We still can't see your video. Thousands of years ago, what, what people know today is as North America. Uh, natives refer to that as Turtle Island. You would see us later. We see your slideshow, so you may want to share again. Stop, share, and share again. On the banks of, of many rivers. Okay, give me a second here. Along the waterways of what is now here, folks, real quick. We call it the Salish Sea. As, as you're hearing that this um, video, we, we um, did a uh, pre or a dry run this, this morning that worked out perfect. So welcome to remote work and virtual learning and everything else. So Laura, I'll get this. Um, and if for some reason we can't pull this up, um, Maybe what we can do is just listen, um, and then we'll sh we're sharing the link in the chat box so the graphic can come. Mm -hmm. um, because again, um, it's our, it's a story that is important to be shared. David Bean, Tate Scott, Spoil Pups Chet. Thousands of years ago, what, what people know today is as North America. Uh, natives refer to that as Turtle Island. You would see us living in, in, in all directions, Twelve tribe. Uh, Laura, many, let me share my screen. Live along the banks of, of many rivers. We, we fished along. Okay, the KP, I hear you. It's now known as Puget Sound. We call it the Salish Sea. After contact, David Bean, Tate Scott, Spoil Pups Chet. Thousands of years ago, what, what people know today is as North America. Uh, natives refer to that as Charter Island. You would see us living in, in, in all directions. Twelve Tribe and, and many people who live in the Puget Sound. We lived along the banks of, of many rivers. We, we fished along the waterways of what is now known as Puget Sound, we call it the Salish Sea. After contact with the non-Indians, our way of life as we knew it was drastically impacted. These settlers came and occupied this land. You know, they sought to take our land from us. They sought to take ownership, take possession of the land. When our ancestors signed those treaties, they believed that they were taking care of not only their community, but generations to come. We signed them as nations. And what many folks don't know is that tribes are sovereign nations with sovereign authority. Over a century ago, you look at our fights that we fought based on our sovereignty, our treaty rights, uh, it's nothing new to us to protect it, to preserve it, but also to tell the story and educate others on what sovereignty is. The best education we can give to our future generations is being the example, and that's what we need to do for future leaders. Our tribal government, many tribal governments, function the same as any city, county, state, or federal government. The Puyallup Tribal Council makes decisions that impact the lives of our community that impact the health of our community, uh, that impact housing, that impact our ability to fish and hunt within our ancestral lands. When the federal government and the state government 
did not honor those treaties, we had folks who began to fight back. We had folks from all directions come and support the Washington tribes. They came in to support us in exercising our treaty rights. Eventually, this matter was taken to court. And in 1974, the Bolt decision recognized our right to take fish. It was also the beginning of a court mandate to the federal government to honor their, their treaty obligations. Our leaders at the time recognized that we were sovereign nations. They recognized that we did not have a tax base. They recognized that we can make and pass laws that govern. They recognized that they can engage in gaming. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And we'll, we'll continue with our um, presentation. And thanks, everyone, for your patience um, with this wonderful environment we're all in, right? <laughs> but it brings us all together today, though, so it's all good. Um, so uh, just to reaffirm that um, uh, tribal sovereignty is the inherent right of tribal nations to self-govern and oversee the well-being of their citizens, lands, and resources and that our American Indian Alaska Native students are citizens and descendants of, of sovereign tribal nations. Um, so we wanted to, to um, continue to invite you to join us for um, the Since Time and Memorial uh, Ready to Go Teacher to Teacher uh, webinars. Um, this is a, the Since Time and Memorial curriculum is required to be uh, uh, integrated into all schools in Washington State, elementary through high school. Um, and what the curriculum uh, does is it, it shares about um, the history of tribal peoples um, from the perspective of the tribes and in collaboration with the tribes that are nearest to your school. So it's about integrating the history of the peoples closest um, to, uh, uh, to your schools. Um, and um, again, uh, the, the link to the webinar is being posted and we, we look forward to learning together uh, more about uh, tribal history and tribal sovereignty. Um, and we know that when we um, have done our work in a good way, um, I, I was mindful of our tribal leader who shared that how, how we do our work is by setting example. Um, and this is one way for us to, um, you know, for us to lead and set example in a good way with, um, with, our, with our, our students. And families. Um, and uh, so John, would you like to uh, um, share, share more ab about this? Uh, what's what, about this teaching? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Laura Lynn. And, and I just wanted a, a big shout out to both um, Dr. Laura Lynn and Joan Banker. I'll, I call them um, lady warriors on the road. Boy, I'll tell you with that STI curriculum trained over 2000 folks, over 2000 educators, in a real short period of time um, from when um, COVID um, broke out and so forth to ask, we, the, the direction was get us some ready to go, get us something in place right now that um, folks can utilize. And I'll tell you, um, just growing all kinds of momentum, 2000 already trained with, I believe another thousand on the books, some um, to be trained in these upcoming. So oh, close to our over 3000 folks in probably um, I'd say within a three, three to four month um, um, span, pretty incredible. Hey, this fo folks, what, what you're looking at here is you're looking at an ocean going canoe that comes from the, the land of the Quinault um, out in Tahola, Washington on the Quinault Indian Reservation. The, the skipper in the back of the canoe is um, Richie Underwood. He's one of my um, native brothers. I refer to him as real close friend, played a lot of softball back in the day and so forth together. But um, this ocean going canoe, I, I, I use this as an analogy as um, all paddles pulling together as one. What you see in the canoe today is um, you see uh, um, a group of, of students from Kingston High School. Um, I was asked by the football coach to um, get the kids off or, you know, to, to see if we can go out to, to the land of the Quinault to um, do a three-day camping trip to work on some teamwork concepts and this and that and whatever else. And I said, well, what's the intent? He said, to get them away from the distractions. I said, well, identify what you mean by distractions. He said, parents. And I said, wait now, wait now, I'm a parent. That's my son. That's your quarterback on your team and so forth. But I totally understand just that real specific time to work together and so forth. But all paddles pulling together as one. 
I'll tell you, this was a this this was an experience of a lifetime for these young men that were were in this ocean going canoe. This is the very first canoe that come out of the. Or I, I, I'll, I, I retract that. I'm not sure if it's the first canoe that came out of the land of the Quinault, but uh, one of the, the very first canoes that um, joined in on these canoe journeys that take place during the summer. This canoe here, it's called Wolf's Coat, and that's the Quinault word on the side there. This was um, built by Stanley Black and Guy Kapolman, two Native American um, um, carvers, artists, and just all around good people from, from Tohola. And um, I'll tell you, this canoe here has over, I believe it's um, what I was told was over 12,000 miles on the ocean. This canoe traveled for over 30 days during, um, consecutively during um, one of the canoe jour journeys getting up to British Columbia. Um, but this canoe, what it talks about, you don't see um, canoes like this. And, by, by, um, and, and please don't call it a boat because if you call it a boat, you got to jump out. And the hard part is trying to get back in <laughs> once you jump out. <laughs> Um, but anyway, these kids had a great time. All paddles pulling together. As you can see that the paddles are not in unison. You see the, get the, the one way in the back, he's out of the water. Others are pulling at different levels and so forth. But, and I also use the analogy of the braid, the braid that you've seen on David Bean's, um, um, Chairman Bean's um, um, back of his, his head. The beautiful braid uh, and what those weaves stand for. But, and again, to, with this canoe, these kids started talking as we go up and down the Quinault River. This was a picture going up the river. And you, you can see, again, we weren't in unison, but I'll tell you, coming back down that river, we are cracking. And we're heading for the mouth of the river. And the kids said, oh, you, let's go. Let's get out into the ocean. I said, I did not get permission slips for you kids to be in the ocean. We'll stay in, in the river. We're okay with that. But on the way down, everybody in unison, they started talking about all these little team concepts, fourth quarter, everybody together, no give up, no quit. Um, they were talking about how fast they can get that canoe um, going up and down the, 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 the transportation highways. Um, Richie Underwood, again, the skipper in the back, just all kinds of lessons that came about as we were going up and down. And, and, and as he was talking and, and the kids were feeling it real life. One thing about this canoe, folks, not a measuring tool used on it, okay? Not a standard or modernized um, measuring tool. This was built through an old growth tree through traditional ways. And I'll tell you, this thing glided like it was on ice. It, it, it just cut right through that water and, and man, what a feeling. But again, um, you know how teenagers can be at times, the young man up front was calling out the, um, his buddy in the back. So why don't we get the big guy out of the canoe if we can go faster? Big guy hollers out from the back. He says, I'm your anchor. I'm your, I'm your rudder. I'm keeping you moving forward here. Just keep pulling. <laughs> He'd say, you know, type of thing. So just the conversations that come out of this type of work. This is the right work, folks. This is about making those connections with our kids. This is about figuring out what our kids are passionate about and making those, making that connection. And again, it's about the future. It's about clearing these pathways to brighter futures. And, and I, just, I just keep saying, we can do this. But it's going to take all of us to take a step back, take a look in. If there's somebody, if, if you have a friend next to you or whatever, um, whatever that might be, that, that's all about it. And that, that, that has a deeper dive on, on the understanding of this. Talk to them. Acknowledge that. If there's somebody that needs a nudge to jump on board, give them a gentle nudge. That's fine. But I'll tell you, as a director of Native Education for the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction in the state of Washington, my, my, my intent is to take the lead, not just within the state, but within the nation. Because throughout the nation, we're seeing some of these same things. Low, low assessment scores low graduation rates. It's common throughout. It's time, folks, it's time to come together. It's time to get all those oars, all those paddles in that water and pull together as one. We can do this. These kids are counting on us. I wanna thank you for your time and your understanding and for your willingness to be here today. Thank you, John. And um, so, if you could just share into the chat, we have um, um, just one other thing that we'd like to share with you after after you've shared with us. So we wanted to give some uh, offer some 
uh, some tips in terms of, of how we can do this polling together. But first, we'd like to hear something that you learned about tribal sovereignty today. And, and then how does this connect with your work again? Uh, uh, um, if you could just take a moment to share. And then, uh, Joan, as those comments are coming forward, we're reaching our time here. No new comments about uh, learning about tribal sovereignty today. Okay. Um, connections are so important. Positive opportunities are crucial. Um, turning negative situations into positive, lifelong, memorable experiences. Um, more of a reminder that maintaining hunting, fishing rights is a major part of sovereignty. Um, how this connects to their work, students, families, and colleagues, um, and how important that is. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. So these are kind of three key areas that we would invite you to consider as, as you're continuing to pull, pull together, as we're pulling together, um, that continue, please continue to attend to your own learning, um, learning of your colleagues. Um, that, that we didn't learn a lot of this history and it's important that we do this work um, uh, ongoing, um, that, we, that we honor through our actions and our words, that's that example setting, um, that our students, we recognize that American Indian Alaska Native students are citizens and descendants of sovereign nations um, and, and continue to do our work through government to government uh, relationship building um, as well as other uh, relationship building. Um, and that we do our work in collaboration, um, that it really is going to take individual and collective action um, for us to, to make the shifts that we're going to need to, to make. Um, always asking ourselves, what do we keep? What do we change? And what, do we want to, what are we going to let go of? And being able to articulate the why. Why is it that it's important? Um, um, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity to be here um, and to, uh, to, to share today. Um, and looking forward to our continued collaborations. John? Just wanted to add on real quick. I know we're running out of time. Folks, it's all about that relationship. It's all, it's all about that relation, relational trust and building that relationship with families, with, with native learners, families, and tribal educators. Um, and I always keep asking, why not? And if there's anything that we can do to help encourage and support that process, please reach out with those long arms. We can do this. With that said, I want to, you know, want to make sure that um, we thank you for your involvement again, and, and we'll take a look at the recordings, and we'll take a look at the chat line, we'll take a look at, um, again, how we can um, help from the Office of Native Education. John and Laura, do you want to say a couple of words about these resources that you have listed? Um, yes, yeah, so we've also included um, some additional resources on tribal sovereignty, um, uh, other resources on native education, and um, a specific resources um, addressing uh, boarding schools. Um, these, these resources are not by any means, ex you know, the only resources, but we just wanted to offer some resources at, for next steps. Thank you. And Thanks. just just to add on to that as well, Kathy and Laura is um, the R16 Comprehensive Center work is um, reaching out. We just put on a, a presentation called "Share Our Stories, Hear Our Voices" with the intent of hearing the family voice, the Native family voice, on what types of needs they need right now and what what that might look like um, coming up. Our next presentation, our our next webinar with. Um, the Share Our Stories, Hear Our Voices is scheduled for December 2nd. Everybody invited. We identified what those needs are. Now it's time to start wrapping around support services. So thank you. John. Um, and as we are about out of time, I just wanted to remind people that as you have questions, um, John and Laura and I are all here to help you. And so if you'd like to contact us, um, we are available by email. Just send us a note. Um, and we're coming back this afternoon, um, but this month, this next month, we're going to be talking about the data toolkit. So we're going to be looking at the power of protocols to review data with an equity lens. 
And we're also going to be looking at educational data sovereignty, native voices and data. So if this has been of interest to you and you want to learn more, please come back next month. Um, this afternoon, we are going to be talking about promising practices in native education. And we have just an amazing panel that John and Laura have put together, including the Muckleshoot Tribal School, uh, Nisqually Indian Tribe, and North Thurston Public Schools. So um, if you'd like to learn more about uh, tribal consultation and what that looks like uh, right now in, in the COVID virtual world, <laughs> um, that's going to be happening this afternoon. Thanks again to our presenters for presenting what awesome information and thanks to our audience for checking it out and sticking around. We'll see you this afternoon.